Good evening. Well, here's our final lecture, and it's Bartok. It does connect so well to what uh, we've been talking about with Elgar, um, his relationship to folk music and his dislike of it, and et cetera. I won't go back on the Elgar talk, but it does really relate to Bartok's obsession with folk music. This piece, which we're going to delve into quite a bit, Contrast, was written in 1938, but it wasn't premiered until 1942. And I mention that because I think it's interesting to just get a glimpse of 1942 musically. The same year that Bartok's Contrast was premiered, this piece was premiered. <laughs> In case you're wondering, it is Richard Strauss. You know, Richard Strauss was born in 1864, Bartok in 1881. Bartok died of leukemia right uh, in 1945 as the war ended, and Strauss made it to 1949. So it's interesting, though, to just think of premieres of music of Bartok at the same time as Richard Strauss. It's just the way the world goes. But this was also premiered that year. <laughs> I'm not sure premiere is the word you normally use for Glenn Miller, but uh, <laughs> it's a, it was a very, and it still is, we live in a very eclectic musical world with many time zones interlocking, and it's, it's kind of a fascinating thing to consider. Of those two things, uh, the Strauss and the Glenn Miller, the one that was actually closer to Bartok was Glenn Miller, although he would not say that. He loved jazz, and he loved Gershwin's music, but he thought of Gershwin and we'll get into this a little bit in the piece, he thought of Gershwin as a composer like himself, like Bartok, and like Stravinsky, using the folk material of his country to write art music. He didn't think of it as commercial. So, and he had great disdain for commercial music. Um, now, I'm going to use some technology. We're all high tech today, because before we hear any actual live music, sorry about that, um, First, we're going to hear a little bit of music uh, that is a folk piece played by folk musicians from Hungary, uh, and they're playing a verbonko. Now, the first movement of the Bartok contrast is called verbonko. It means recruitment dance, and I was considering dancing it for you. <laughs> I did learn it, and I can teach it to you. But then I found a couple of YouTube examples, and I think uh, we'll do that. Uh, <laughs> But feel free to, to, to join in. Uh, but the Verbonkos is an interesting uh, and very old Hungarian dance in which it, it func functioned like Uncle Sam Wants You. It was a commercial for the army. And the way they used to do it is they would send soldiers sp specifically trained to do this dance to small villages where nothing was going on. And they would do these dances, and the young men would want to learn the dances. And then they would say, come with us. And that's how they <laughs> recruited. It's very clever. Um, there are all things, there are things like that now, but they're not quite so obvious. So here, well actually they are, <laughs> but that's okay. So here is a little music from a verbonkos that is a completely folk music verbonkos. It is in no way uh, written by anyone. It's improvised by these musicians. <laughs> Those were those are all string instruments. <laughs> okay, that's not a kazoo. That's a violin. Um, some some folk players were fabulous. It so happens that this is really you know it's not out of the ordinary. That's more ordinary. Here and this is a, a video. This is a, a verbonkos or verbonko that is not improvised. It is not folk music. It so happens that Bartok was not the first composer to take the recruiting dance and write classical music, so-called classical music, based on it. Here is one by uh, Janos Lavota, a, a Hungarian, 
uh, played by two Hungarians here, and he lived from 1764 to 1820. So this is a very different kind of verbonko. He doesn't look too excited. <laughs> okay. I think you would agree that's probably enough of that. <laughs> Now, you might be wondering, but I think it's important to know, I, I, that was a particularly bad performance of a not very interesting piece, but <laughs> it's better to have a great performance of that, and I couldn't find one, that's all there is. He must be enormous, don't you think? Did you see how little that violin looks? Uh, either that or it's a very small violin. Now, here we have an authentic Verbunko dance troupe. Now, by authentic, I mean these are folk dancers from Hungary, now, it was re filmed recently, um, you see them there. They're not professional dancers, they are folk mu dancers from a community, and this is a film they made themselves, of course it's on YouTube, I mean it's like anybody else, this is not a professional thing, but this is really what this dance is like. Let me go back, a yeah that's a good spot. <laughs> Doesn't that make you want to go to the army with them? <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll all do it later. <laughs> um, but I, I just as a last video here, th I think this is quite interesting. If I have to find it, it seems to... Oh, yeah. Um, the next thing is not exactly professional, but it also is, and, th and this is a typical thing with folk dance. These are romanche, it says in the thing here, gypsy f folk dancers, doing Hungarian verbunko dancing, but they do it for money on stage around the world. And in order to make it really popular, they speed it up to make almost two times as fast and sometimes four times as fast. So it's not at all authentic, but they do it, uh, and they've been doing it this way for so long that it is the way it is now. I mean, that's, this is what people think it is. The original Verbunko, uh, the soldiers would come in to a town and start it very slowly and get faster and faster and faster. But that's also what gypsy music, uh, I should say 18th, and this isn't, Verbunko is not gypsy, it's Hungarian. But, and the Romanche version of all of the Hungarian folk tunes was to start them slow and get faster and then to go back slow and then faster and faster and faster. So that's actually not a pure th Hungarian thing. That's the way gypsies tend to play and perform. And here's a fabulous performance. Um, why is it disappearing? For here it is. Press the video button. <laughs>
hate to stop them, but that does make you want to join the army. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's a little more effective, actually. I mean, if you live in a town where nothing's going on. Now, <clears throat> let's get to the bar talk for a moment. I think we should hear some of the opening uh, of the piece. It, it's not like that at all. Um, it's much more uh, in the slower dance. It's not a slow thing, it's moderate, but it's more in the um, almost seductive vein. And let's, let's hear a little bit of this piece and then we'll get into it. Okay, great, great, thank you. This is going to be wonderful. It already is. You know, the very opening, could you just play your, just the violin alone for a moment? Do you know this piece? Oh, you, da you can't because it's not plugged in. Sorry about that. I'm sure you know this piece. You know it, of course. It has a, a similar, I mean, the strumming opening. It's, it's the Ravel blues movement. Uh, yes, of course, Bartok knew the Ravel, but they're both being influenced by uh, things across the seas a little bit. And remember, this was, a, a, it's hard to remember if you don't know this. <laughs> so remember if you know it, uh, <laughs> and now you'll find out about it. Uh, it famously written for Benny Goodman and, uh, and the violinist Sigidi, uh, the Hungarian violinist who convinced Benny Goodman, uh, I'm not going to explain who Benny Goodman is, that you can figure, uh, to Benny Goodman commissioned the piece because he had money, uh, and the idea was that they would play it together. And Bartok knew it would be performed a lot in the United States, and he wanted to have uh, a success. Uh, but he wanted it to also to be, he was always very, very serious, this extremely serious person. And he loved, as I mentioned, Gershwin, and he knew the Ravel, and he knew how Stravinsky had incorporated elements of, of jazz and American music. So writing for Benny Goodman, it was a natural thing to ha make references to that kind of steady beat, even though it is a verbonco, it is also full of jazzy things. Now, I was thinking about how I could take this piece apart for you, which I will do a little bit, but before I do it, I'm going to do a little expose on Bartok's technique abstractly. So how did he write music? What is it all about? How do you understand what's going on? Because uh, it, I think it would be more effective if I explain it to you separately from the piece and then back into the piece. So, excuse me. <laughs> you were so prepared to get up. <laughs> um, here, you go over there. So, I'm going to start by playing something and see if you recognize the tune. You probably will. This is a way of getting into the whole thing. I hope it's because you know it's this old man, right? Now, 
what I did there is, is, this is like a teaching piece, and Bartok wrote lots of teaching pieces. I'm looking at you, you probably know them all, right? The microcosmos, um, we're gonna get into those too. But you recognize it, but the tune is not always right. First of all, the accents are in the wrong place. And then the notes are wrong, right? Okay, what, what happens is that the mode is different. And we all know that the ma major is a mode, minor is a mode, and there are different kinds of minor modes, but there are many, many modes. And Bartok's way of composing is to take folk modes from Hungary, Romania, Bulgaria, and, and actually also Arab folk modes, and even what he called the jazz folk modes, which were he thought was of as American folk music. And he took all these modes and used them freely to create a 12-tone or a completely saturated chromatic palette. He gave a lecture at Harvard University when he did finally get an opportunity to speak here, and he called it poly, uh, polymodal chromaticism. Polymodal obviously means more than one mode at a time, and chromaticism means using the chromatic scale of Western music. So, for example, he said, if you, uh, this is right from the Harvard lectures, if you take the Phrygian mode, well, I should say what the Phrygian mode is, shouldn't I? I think so. Yes, the Phrygian mode, I, I'll, I'll review all the church modes. How many of you know the church modes? That's fine. <laughs> <laughs> this is Dorian. D, A, C, Re, D, A, C, La. That's, you know, the Dorian mode. Uh, and then if you go up, this is the Phrygian mode. This Phrygian mode has a half step at the bottom, which is kind of unusual. And it's used a lot in many uh, cultures, and it's also very Spanish. Especially if you raise the third. flat it and raise it back and forth. That's one of the things Bartok liked, that in folk cultures, modes often had lowered and raised um, steps of the scale that were not organized, they're just expressive. Now, uh, to, to keep it going, then you have Lydian, which sounds exactly like major except for one note. <laughs> that was a hint. Leonard Bernstein, I've I always quote this because it's the most famous Lydian mode in American music history. That's the raised fourth. So that's Officer Krupke, which probably is Hungarian. <laughs> um, and then you have the Mixolydian mode. What? That was you laughing. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> nice, to nice to meet you. <laughs> the Mixolydian mode sounds just like major except for one note. Again, a different note. Right, that's... So, um, and then there are other modes. Bartok's idea was to combine, for example, the Lydian and the Phrygian mode starting on the same pitch. So if you take C and you do the um, Lydian mode and the, um, fri uh, the Phrygian mode, that happens to give you the whole chromatic scale All I'm doing is playing wildly in, on, out of control notes from those two <laughs> modes. But if you do that, you're in Bartok's world because you're mixing two modes to get a chromatic scale. It's getting clear, right? Okay, so uh, there are some Hungarian modes that he liked to write with. Uh, here is one, which is very strange uh, in the world of scales. It's strange because it, it's not it, it divides itself in half. It sounds like two other modes. This part of it sounds like an octatonic mode, which um, goes whole step, half step, whole step, half step, whole step, half step, whole step. But only the bottom part does. The top part sounds like the whole tone scale, all whole tones. So if you mix that up, 
It also is a very Bartok sound because he liked to use it. Then another mode is only six notes, another Hungarian mode. And again, it sounds Phrygian at first, like the lowered, like that uh, Phrygian mode we heard a moment ago, but then it's not. I put it in an F, there's no F in that scale. But did you notice that? <laughs> okay. <laughs> then, uh, if you take the harmonic minor scale, which is one that everybody practices all over the Western world, and reverse the half, uh, switch the top to the bottom. Uh, th they're called tetrachords, four notes. If you reverse them and you do this, that is another Hungarian mode. You have to wait for it. <laughs> okay. Now, just to make this even more clear, because I want this to be so clear. I have a bunch of things here. I'm just going to take this tune. Now, it's in the major mode. It has a few expressive little chromatic notes. It that note is not in the scale. There it is again. <laughs> okay, if I put it in Phrygian, it just sounds like this. different world. You see, the mode is everything. It really is. Here's the same thing in the Lydian mode. And there's only one note changed from major, but I also didn't, I didn't put that little note in. <laughs> Seems kind of playful. I think that Bernstein was right to use that for Officer Karupke because it does sound like somebody is, is tweaking the motor, making fun of it in some way, you know, that one note, you know, when you go. <laughs> okay, here's the octatonic mode. They're great. Now, if you take Mary Had a Little Lamb, go ahead. <laughs> I mean, if, if I take Mary Had a Little Lamb, I'm going to do two Bartok, I'm, I'm not done with Bartok's language yet. I think it's going to be very easy to listen to all of these things. Because aside from the modal mixing, there's a whole rhythmic element, which is extremely important. The rhythmic element, uh, in its simplest version, okay, <laughs> I don't want that to go in your violin, uh, in its sim <laughs> simplest version, <coughs> is what's called the aksak rhythm, which is a li it's the, literally, in Hungarian, it means limping. And it's threes and twos. One, two, three, one, two, one, two, three, one, two, one, two, three, one, two, or one, two, one, two, three, one, two, one. So it's like you have uneven legs. That's why it's called the aksak rhythm. Uh, Bella Bartok works that way. Bella Bartok. That's, they're both three, but not if you decide that it's Bella Bartok, Bella Bartok, Bella, or Bella Bartok, Bella Bartok. That's better. Do like a Bella Bartok? Bella Bartok. Okay. So, and here is uh, Mary Had a Little Lamb with some of the, ry the rhythms turned into oxoc rhythms, the modes mixed um, in more than one way.
Now these dissonances, they could come from mixed modes. Now I've read a lot of theoretical descriptions of why are these dissonances are there, and it started to seem to me th that they're really absurd because they have to be there because he likes the sound and because it comes out of the folk world of these drones and out of tune strings and things like that. And Bartok himself said the following about, um, you'll get to sit down in a minute, but um, about this sort of thing. Bartok, quote from his Harvard lectures, I never created new theories in advance. I hated such ideas. I had, of course, a very definite feeling about certain directions to take, but at the time of the work, I did not care about the designations which would apply to those directions or to their sources. This is Bartok himself. This attitude does not mean that I composed without set plans and without sufficient control, sufficient control. The plans were concerned with the spirit of the new work and with technical problems, for instance, formal structure involved uh, by the spirit of the work, all more or less instinctively felt. So his process is more like what you would want it to be. And I was never concerned with general theories to be applied to the works I was going to write. Now, the greatest part of my work has already been written. This is 1943 when he said this. Certain general tendencies appear, general formulas from which theories can be deduced. But now, even now, I would prefer to try new ways and means instead of deducing theories. So you can find a huge amount. Uh, in fact, I read six paragraphs on why <laughs> this sound appears, in which this fifth was related to one mode, and this fifth was predicting the mode in the next bar. That went on and on. Then a new edition came out of contrasts. <coughs> That's from contrast. And Peter Bartuk was editing the whole thing, his son. And he wrote a note that says that that dissonance is there because it's a dissonance. <laughs> that my father wanted to be there. <laughs> I'm not sure if I can find the exact words, but it's pretty much what it is. Yeah, it's there, you know, to, because he wanted the dissonance, obviously. Um, now, a few more little things, and then we're really going to hear a lot of the piece. This is going to be now rhythm and mode. This is okay. You're right, standing. Rhythm and mode uh, transformations of "Take Me Out to the Ball Game." And why am I using these songs? Because this really fits Bartuk's technique. Bartuk wrote using Hungarian and Romanian and Bulgarian and Arabic and. A well, he didn't use American folk songs. So if you take a tune you know, and you hear Bartok's technique applied it, it sounds very different than if it's a tune that you just are told is a Romanian folk tune, you've never heard it before. How do you know what he did, right? So that's why I'm doing this, because I think it really works. So take me out to the ball game. We all know how it goes. Here what I've done is give it one of these uh, drones and uh, repeated, this is drones in the old meaning of the word. And, uh, and then the rhythm, I've evened out the notes more or less and then accented them in the oxoc twos and threes. Okay, you see, that's take me out to the ballgame. And then all you have to do is add some uh, folksy accompaniments and some dissonances. That's the first one. <laughs> now, the next one is, uh, and you know, Bartok wrote a lot of pieces to teach technique, composition technique, and piano technique, mostly for his son, Peter Bartok, who did go through most of them. Uh, <coughs> and one of the ideas was to use counterpoint to create what we call simultaneities, harmonies that are only the result of the fact that there's counterpoint. Bartok felt that the three composers that influenced him the most, that made him write the way he wrote, were Debussy, Beethoven, and Bach. Debussy because Debussy liberated music from functional harmony, allowed any chord to exist because of the way it sounds with the next chord, and also because Debussy also used many different modes. Unlike Bartok, he didn't fuse them together. They retained their identity completely. So you'll hear a pentatonic mode, which you do in Bartok too. Uh, and you might hear the whole tone scale in Debussy. It's not that you might, you will. 
<laughs> but mixed with different harmonies. So Bartok likes the idea of the freedom of modes, which he took much further than Debussy, but he thanked Debussy for the start. And for Beethoven, he took the idea of large-scale structures, things returning, circular structures, arc forms, which he used himself. Beethoven being the first classical composer, <coughs> I, I don't know why I'm saying classical. Everyone makes you say that all the time now. I think it's kind of obvious that he was a classical composer. Um, but Beethoven was the first to bring music from earlier movements back in later movements, and, that be, and to structure pieces so that they refer back in a sense of memory and, and co closure of a new kind was achieved in these forms. Um, so th that was a big uh, influence for Bartok. And finally, Bach, because as you'll hear in this piece and in most of Bartok's pieces, there's a lot of counterpoint and a lot of individuality with things overlapping. So what you hear is overlapping modes, interlocking Aksak rhythms and other rhythms from other uh, styles, including jazz, and uh, counterpoint. So if I take, take me out to the ball game, and I do it in the Phrygian mode. Now if I do this, and I imitate it a phrase later in an exact canon, meaning playing the same thing lower, it, it sounds like a Bartok exercise. Now the last one, before I let you actually hear real Bartok again, is if you take, take me out to the, I hate saying if you take, take me out to the ballgame. <laughs> if you take me out to the ballgame isn't right either though. <laughs> okay, if you have, take me out to the ballgame. Shouldn't it be if you have taken me out to the ballgame? Okay, <laughs> and you do it in the whole tone scale. really strange. Uh, and then I add dissonant punctuation. Now I haven't mentioned dissonant punctuation, but I'm going to mention it right now. In a lot of Bartok's music, you hear clusters, and you're going to play quite a, a lot of these, you know, actual clusters. Clusters meaning groups of notes clustered together. Or, and he likes to distinguish between three kinds of clusters, which are the three primary kinds. Diatonic clusters, just a scale chromatic clusters, the chromatic scale, and whole tone clusters. Whole tone clusters are whole tone scales. Um, he first heard them, Bartok first heard clusters in a house in London where he was staying, it was kind of like a hotel for musicians. And one of the other musicians, much younger than Bartok, who was staying there was Henry Cowell, the American exper experimentalist, we used to say maverick, but that word got ruined. But, um, <coughs> but anyway, he, Bartok, came downstairs in the room where there was the communal piano, and somebody was taking his arms, it was Henry Cowell, and just smashing the keys and playing this violent, clustery music. And Bartok thought, this is amazing, this guy's amazing, he's such an animal, it's so, you know, uh, it's exciting and fantastic and new. Bartok, and this tells you a lot about his personality, didn't mention anything, to, he said at first, that was very exciting, he wrote him a letter and asked for permission to use clusters, <laughs> which is ridiculous. So Henry Cowell wrote back, I didn't invent them, and I couldn't pass, they're public domain, it's just, you know, <laughs> smashing the note status. <laughs> Be my guest. And, and basically, in fact, Ives had done them first, but, you know, lots of children do them, and, you know, <laughs> uh, and in fact, Henry Cowell, when he was a little boy, did things like that on the piano, and his father uh, uh, and mother especially encouraged him to do more, and he just continued doing it, basically. <laughs> it's like, unlike everyone else, will you learn to play some notes? Okay, so anyway, 
he gave Bartek the, you know, free reign, saying this is none of, it's none of my business. But they became friends uh, as much as possible. And uh, Bartok told Henry Cowell that he used something that he called punctuation, which was this dissonant punctuation. So if you take a folk tune, like Take Me Out to the Ball Game, and put it in the, um, in this case, the whole tone scale, you can punctuate the holes with dissonance. Or like which is something Bartok does. He doesn't always do only the silences or the rests or the, or the held notes. He does places where the rhythm is defined, just like a colon, a semicolon, uh, an exclamation point, a question mark. Um, and I'm talking about in real um, speech now, not the Victor Borger version of that. So, <coughs> so here is, uh, take me out to the ball game with both of those techniques. So it gives you the basic idea. Now we go back to the actual music. So you can all write some Bartok now. <laughs> See, but it's, it's always fun when it's really clear like that because it, you know, Bartok was often received very badly. The name Bartok, while he was alive, people were terrified. They and there are, uh, even today, there are a lot of concert audiences where they're afraid of Bartok. Uh, but actually, Bartok's stuff is, is very folksy and very earthy, and, the, and it's also the technique is actually not complex. Um, when he, uh, I mean, it's complex results, but the, what goes into it is actually very genuine and uh, derived from folk material and, and also quite easy to understand. Uh, when Yehudi Menuhin was quite young, he premiered Bartok's violin concerto, and they had a meeting, it was a famous meeting because Menuhin wrote it up, and he said he came to play the violin concerto. Do you know this story? It's a good story. He came to play the violin concerto for, for Bartok, and everyone was always terrified of Bartok. He was very small and frail, uh, Ill, Ill most of the time. Uh, you know, he w I, I have some theories about this, but uh, I've actually diagnosed it, but I'm not going to get into it right now. <laughs> but um, he was very severe and scared a lot of people. His, he was a difficult teacher. The way he taught piano was people would play for him, and then they would get up and he would play it better and then he and then he just he wouldn't say anything <laughs> but it wasn't just better you could play it really well and then he would play it differently it had to be the way he wanted it and he didn't ever want to hear anything played differently than the way he wanted it which is very difficult teaching but of course if you could do it then you achieve something what this is questionable but um. <laughs> so anyway many when played this for him and bartok said i didn't think after the first movement, it was possible to hear anyone play a piece of music like that until a composer had been dead for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> I know, it's a very dark compliment. <laughs> and I think by the time anyone realized it was a huge compliment, <laughs> they had gone on to the next... Uh, okay. So what was I leading to with that? Oh, yes. That, you know, Menuhin became uh, a real advocate of world music in the early days of that expression, like with uh, Ravi Shankar, things like this. And, and Bartok was really one of the prime examples of a composer who, if, if he were working the way he worked today, he would be a pop star because he was taking folk music of his country and other countries and doing world music, and he was even interested in all these other instruments, and then writing his own personal version of it. And that, that's the way so much music is now. But now it's not seen as, as uh, derived from Bartok, and maybe, maybe it is, maybe it isn't. But there you have it. Okay, now, you're probably not warmed up anymore. <laughs> Back to the piece. Let's do some highlights of some exciting... Mo oh, you know what? I'm sorry, one more thing. You know <laughs> Here is something by Henry Cowell, the, probably the piece that Bartok heard. Thank you. 
doesn't quite have the ring of truth of the Bartok uh, because there's nothing but the clusters. And, you know, with Bartok, everything was a piece of was vocabulary to be used into uh, part of his own grammar. And in a way, what Cowell's f failing was that he basically explored vocabulary and he never explored any grammar. You can't just do that. You know, I mean, it doesn't usually last. It had a huge impact on other people, but um, it's, and it's always interesting to hear some of it now and then, which we just did. Okay. <laughs> now, back to the piece. So, right, let's hear the, right at the very beginning, you hear a, a major, in the, uh, I'm just going to do a little bit of analysis, to, to an A major strumming in the, uh, in the violin, and you hear at first the Lydian mode in the clarinet, because if you're getting A major, and, and you there's that note. It's the same Officer Krupke note. And then that actually becomes a very big part of the whole piece. Uh, like Beethoven, he wanted to take if a small motif and use it over and over, explore it, and build it into a large-scale structure. So we, we will explore that in just a moment. So let's, let's hear a little bit of that. And then she slips into another mode right away, Steve being the clarinet, Romy. OK, let's hear it from the start again. a new mode, another one, Great, and we're going to keep going, but stopping for a moment. So you, the clarinet licks, these are things inspired by Benny Goodman, but they, they are not, uh, they're, they're not that complicated. Basically, if you take, um, uh, I'll just go up in thirds without, these are not, this is not exactly it yet. You can flat and sharp anything you want. So. Uh, also like Benjamin Britten, another contemporary, to take thirds and explore uh, whether the base of, the, of this long string of thirds is major or minor, whether the sevenths are major or minor, just alterating, alterating, alterating? Altering them, <laughs> or alterating them, I mean, it's after all, it's Hungarian. Um, uh, changing the sharps and flats in the same way that jazz composers actually do. Now, if you know jazz notation, uh, it looks a lot like Baroque notation, in that there will be like the note G, it'll say G. And then you'll see a nine and a seven, which means, you can stay there. <laughs> uh, let's, here's a G. If I say nine, then I want nine above as part of the chord. But if I want uh, the seventh um, sharp, I go. If I want the fifth flat. So basically that, Th these things change the harmony th because you're lowering or raising or leaving alone a note in relationship to the key. So Baroque composers and performers and also jazz uh, performers do the same thing, which is they write sharp seven or flat seven or sharp nine or flat nine or 13, and they know which note to change. And uh, in a way, Bartok worked exactly the same way. Most composers in a way do, Debussy certainly did. But in this case, the spinning out modal references. We don't need to follow every one of them. It's really not the point. But that all of these changing cascades of thirds are referring to various shifting modes. Meanwhile, the piano is playing pretty much triadic music. Let's hear the piano right there um, where we stopped, you know, where you start playing those triads. Yeah, you see, there's this very simple standard harmonies moving in a way that almost Chopin might move them. They're spelled kind of strangely. <laughs> but they're spelled strangely because he's not thinking of them as triads from another era, from another tradition. He's thinking of them as altered notes. So the expression altered, or sometimes uh, in jazz especially one might say substitutions, altered pitches or substituted pitches for a harmony uh, are fun and they spice things up, literally, and that's exactly the technique that he's using. Um, 
Let's go a little, f in fact, okay, well, I'll just keep going for a moment. Uh, if you want to hear, let's, let's do this in the clarinet at, I have to find a bar <coughs> number, before the più tranquillo, one, two, three, four, where you start those cascading little, those rising. Now these are quintuplets <coughs> or quintolets if you speak French, they're little groups of five, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, and they go up and up and up and up, and then they start to, they still go in the upward direction, but they go down and down and down. And I thought, all right, I'll do some serious analysis. One, two, three, four, five, Five, six of them are octatonic. One of them is Phrygian. Uh, anyway, the fact is they're all changing all the time. Most of them are octatonic. In other words, these little groups, what scales, what modes do they come from? Obviously, he's changing them all the time, not because he's got a theory here, just like he said, but it really is this sound I is exciting because <coughs> it's constantly shifting. It's, co it's kaleidoscopic use of modes. And underneath it, we have some pretty straight ahead harmonies. Um, let me can we just hear the clarinet and the piano without the violin for a moment, starting at um, that, that spot, which is actually 24, 23, the last beat of 22. <coughs> Okay, you see, so those are all modal moments, little scales. If you look for all the scales and you name each scale, you could hand that in as a musicological paper. But that's all you can do with it. You can't do anything else with it. Okay, then this, um, what you just played. Seventh chords going up reminds me a lot of this, only this, you know, do you know this? Yeah, it's from American in Paris. Um, he was, that was probably, that's, a, I brought that whole score in just for that, okay. Um, okay, moving along, for s let's look at some other highlights if we can, oops. Ah, the Oxac rhythm, where it sounds like the, he's, they're saying Bella Bartok at Menomoso. Now this is where you have in the piano dissonances that are just there to be dissonant and it, it gives this earthy, unclean kind of uh, sensuality that, that really is peasanty. You know, peasants don't have clean boots, so why should the piano chords all be clean? Um, and uh, yeah, let's just hear a little bit of that. And then let's go into where we get these large um, triadic chords in the piano as well. So right from the Menomosa is great. Okay, now did you notice, uh, if, you're, if you're letting the harmony sink in, it's modal it's and dissonant in places, and then all of a sudden it's jazzy. I mean, uh, could you just play, the, let's have the piano alone, just play the same thing, and uh, listen to the harmonic progressions, and you'll hear that he's allowing free associative things to happen between modes that he studied and the things that he knows about Benny Goodman's band, probably. Let's hear Isn't it great? I mean, you can't predict it unless you know it because it really has a free associative quality, which is something that he f credits Debussy with having allowed composers to do again. That's something that had disappeared and to, and to a certain extent. Then he makes reference to um, the, the cembalum in the glissandos. Maybe we we'll just hear a little bit of the glissandos um, at tempo one there. 
Yeah, 45. Uh, just the piano is fine at this point. Okay, this is you know the feeling of the cembalum, which is the, the percussion instrument of the Hungarian gypsy orchestras. Um, now I'm going to make make a few comments about the third movement before we hear this whole thing. The third movement, Kristen, it's so terrible what you've done. <laughs> um, normally this is played. <laughs> <laughs> this is usually played on two violins, and she's going to fake it on one violin. Basically, they have a, this is actually fine. Basically, but you've got two clarinets, so look, you, you brought two clarinets. She needs two. One is A and A, one is B flat because it's written that way, and you, the A clarinet is necessary to play the piece, um, as is the B flat. Now, Bartok says, take another violin that's out of tune, tuned in the following way, uh, which is to have a G sharp instead of a G on the bottom and an E flat on the top. And it just sounds like that first violinist we heard, <laughs> who was completely out of tune. <laughs> That's what it sounds like. I mean, because not only do they play out of tune, but they probably don't tune their instruments that much. The other people playing with him were completely out of tune. Did you notice that? It was unbelievably out of tune. And that, it's so out of tune that you have to admire it. <laughs> because I, I just can't imagine doing that. OK, so this, let's hear a little bit of the opening of this. It's, it might remind you of uh, Saint-Saëns' Carnival of the Animals, but it's not quite the same thing. Okay, great, great. It's very exciting, but we have to keep moving. It's very exciting. You get this out of tune sound, then you get an ostinato, which is simply you know, an obstinate recurring motif, which um, he even, he had to credit folk music for that, of course, and, and Stravinsky did it in a way first by taking Russian folk music, which is full of repeated ostinatos and making it part of a mosaic. So you feel like you're hearing a mosaic here where each thing comes in and stays there and then they recombine in various fashions. Very folksy. But he also uses a lot of straight ahead uh, harmonies that, that relate to, not exactly theory, but to one thing at a time, like just fourths or just fifths or just thirds, like one, which is something he liked to do. So for example, can we hear the just fourths just in the piano at, let's, how can we figure out what bar, oh here, bar, before bar 40 where you start doing that, like one, two, three, four bars before that. Okay, see, those are all fourths. It's, you know, just perfect fourths. Why? Okay. Um, <laughs> but he liked, you know, it made him feel good to have, uh, and it, it's, one, it's fun to hear that uh, things change on a dime. They're all fourths, then they're clusters, then suddenly there's this um, a mosaic of modes. And it, he felt that as long as he knew what he was doing in the piece at any given moment. It, the way it connected was something he trusted himself for, and then he would rewrite a lot. But basically, there isn't an exact reason for this. They turn eventually into more dissonant chords and clusters. But before that, he also uses just triads that are major and minor. Can you, that happens at bar 51, 2, 3, just in the piano, please. Okay, now basically, what, can you slow that down? And you have an E flat major chord in the bass. And then, wait, wait, uh, let's do one at a time. E flat, uh, just, a, just a left hand. E flat major, then the right hand. E flat minor, okay, and then in the left hand, I mean, and then D minor, and then D major. So basically, you're just getting E flat major, and then minor, and D minor, and then major. Something Prokofiev also liked to do. This was uh, something that was in the air, uh, but the major and minor sound, when you put those chords together, like if you take D major and you add the minor on top, and same with E flat, starts to sound more like jazz, because the, the um, as, as actually um, some musicologist said to Bartok, it's not jazz what you do, it's George meaning George Gershwin, because <laughs> he didn't know anything about jazz. He just knew George Gershwin, just, just like Ravel, uh, which isn't exactly jazz anyway. So, uh, but it, you get that sound of the, of the flat seventh, the which is the minor third and the major seventh together. 
but it also is a sound that comes out of octatonic scales and combining the modes. So there was a kind of uh, thrill of the fact that this was global language, that it comes out of each of these modes can give you the same interesting harmonies that you get out of other modes and other cultures, and they all start to fuse together, which is really pretty much what's happening in the world of music now, even at a faster pace. Um, let's get to some of these clusters. Can we hear the piano clusters at around 165? And I, we'll hear everybody there. And th th the piano is playing straight ahead. I'm sorry, you have to change um, clarinets all the time. Somebody should invent the clarinet that does both, <laughs> just with a little <laughs> <laughs> Okay, now, right after this very eerie clustery thing, where they're playing clusters combined and the piano has clusters and it's very soft and strange, he goes into something that is, it's a brilliant comment on various music styles. Um, let's just hear the piano right there uh, before 170 pl playing like four bars. Okay, and then they come in and join him. This is actually, to me, comic. It's very funny, um, oh, pardon me. Um, basically, in the right hand, you have a circle of fifths, which is the oldest chord progression uh, of tonal music, once I mean, the most standard thing. Okay? It's, it's basically going down in fifths. It just keeps going. In the left hand, he also has one. Um, but, when you hear it together... <laughs> there, this one <coughs> is actually a, a half step higher than this one. If you played them together, you'd get this. Which you don't want to play them together, but... But what he does is he interlocks them so when this one resolves, you get the chord, but that becomes part of a chord that's a half step below. So between the right hand and the left hand, they are a half step apart. But if you just look at the, um, because of the positions of the chords, if you just look at the chords as blocks, they're going down the whole tone scale. So you are hearing a whole tone scale, a circle of fifths this way. I mean, uh, let's say you're hearing a whole tone scale in block harmony, a circle of fifths also, and another circle of fifths that's a half step lower in canon. This is not something that just happened. This is not something you do by ear. This is very worked out. Um, uh, although it's possible to do it by ear because you think you did it by ear because you're thinking in sound and not in music. That's very important. To, I mean, not in, um, in words. In other words, composers, and musicians generally will often think of something in sound and it can be explained in words and the feeling is, oh yeah, right, that's, that's exactly what it is. Because you're not, I, I doubt that Bartok was working it out because if you play a circle of fifths, you know it's a circle of fifths. You don't have to say that is a circle of fifths consciously. And then the whole pattern, the way it fell apart uh, or falls into place, once it's analyzed, it sounds even more complex than it probably was when it occurred to him. But it's quite great. And, and then it, what happens is they all get involved. Let's hear a little more of that from the piano and then everybody join in. <coughs> okay, now, now uh, uh, look at bar 190. Then he brings in something that goes... Da, 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 da. I want you to hear that because I, I think this is a reference to quite a few things. Okay, great. Okay, now you're probably thinking of many things. Uh, <laughs> um, one of them, though, that you might not be thinking of is this. Oops, let me move a little bit away from... Ah. Oh, my God. 
This is Renard by Stravinsky. Okay, that exact thing uh, is a very famous piece of Stravinsky that Bartok certainly knew, but there's also this, which he also knew. This is Gershwin playing the piano. What is this, though? Whoop, that's not it. Is this Gershwin playing the piano, too? No, this is Bartok. That was Bartok playing the piano, uh, and it's from his book, uh, Microcosmos, it's number four. And this is a book, uh, several, six books actually, which are for piano students, he wrote them for Peter Bartok, and they range from one kind of restriction to one kind of rule to the next, like only seconds, only sevenths, only thirds, um, or a reference or an homage to somebody. There's one to Robert Schumann, for example. This is, it doesn't say it in the, in the score uh, when you buy it, but it does, Bartok did say this, and it is written down elsewhere, that it was an homage to Gershwin. Mm -hmm. And he considered that one of his folk explorations in the microcosmos. You know, uh, he's got some Bulgarian rhythms here, and that's actually one of the Bulgarian rhythms. It's, um, the homage to Gershwin is under the c title Six Bulgarian Dances. So that shows you how he thought of it. Okay, now we got it. So let's hear the first. Are you ready to play or are you wiped out? Okay, <laughs> the, the, the first and third. We're skipping the second movement so you have something to discover. Thank you. 
<laughs> Bravo. Good thing. <laughs> so then Menuhin said, uh, the piece is very chromatic. This is what I forgot to say. He said to Bartok, the piece is very chromatic. And Bartok said, yes, I was trying to show Schoenberg that you can take 12 tones and still write tonal music. <laughs> there we go. All right. Till next time. <laughs> Bravo.